that introduction and for the invitation to speak to you today. And thank you for everyone uh, who's tuned in. Um, this is a really uh, worthwhile and fascinating topic that we're discussing. So um, it's a real pleasure to be participating. Uh, as Martin says, um, my paper is on Algili's Sufi metaphysical view of the Bible. Um, and this grows out of the research that I did for my uh, doctoral thesis here at Oxford, which, um, as Martin says, has been published in book form in this, what I think is quite an attractive looking uh, volume, Sufism and the Scriptures. Um, today, I'm going to be talking on that uh, topic, although um, some of what I say will uh, is not in the book, I mean, it arises out of further reflection and um, and, and thinking about this topic. Um, so I hope uh, you can all hear me and see the PowerPoint. So um, uh, in an article on Drew's polemics uh, or Drew's readings of the Pentateuch published in Abraham Geiger's Jüdische Zeitschrift for Wissenschaft und Leben in 1875, the great Hungarian Jewish Orientalist Ignaz Goldziher wrote the following. Completely in contrast to Muslim orthodoxy, which centered forgeries, interpolations, and omissions in the books of the Old as well as the New Testament, and sought the justification of its confession based largely on this premise, Muslim mysticism was inclined from the very beginning to deal with the religious books of the Jews and Christians in a way that was more favorable to them. Because of its relationship to the Quran, this was very possible for it, and the tolerance that is peculiar to it in all of its developmental stages supported it in the appreciation of those books against which Orthodox Islam argued in the most passionate way. Hence, it is also that quotations from Torah and Psalms appear very often in the writings of the mystics, though of course there are also quite a few inaccurate citations among them. Indeed, the mystic can go so far as to eulogize the confessions that are alien to him and to find in them secrets, or asrar, which are evidence of his own system. Al-Jili, a Muslim mystic of the 14th century, whose work, The Perfect Man in the Knowledge of the Last and First Things, offers comprehensive material for the study of this question. Even finds it, he even finds it in the Jewish ceremonial laws, food ordinances, etc. Secrets of such blazing power that he did not dare to publish them for fear that the believing Mohammedans would abandon their prophet and hurry to the bosom of Judaism. Now, Abdul Karim Jili, uh, the Muslim mystic cited here by Goldziher in a passage which reflects um, fairly widespread views on uh, Sufi views of the Bible for, for Goldziher's time, that's the, the late 19th century. Uh, Jili was born in, in Calicut on the Malabar coast of India in 1365 AD or 767 AH. Uh, in his youth, he was brought by his father to Yemen, uh, where he eventually settled in the city of Zabid on the, that country's western coastal plain. There he joined the Sufi community led by Ismail Ajabarti, died 1403 or 806 age, a prominent sheikh of the Qadari Tariqa, uh, the Ahdali branch of the Qadari order. Jabarti's community was renowned for its proximity to the Rasul dynasty, which ruled Yemen at that time, and for its commitment to Sama, the mystical consul of the Sufis. It was also known for uh, its commitment to the Sufi metaphysics of the great Andalusian Sufi thinker, Muhyiddin ibn al-Arabi. Under Ajabati's direction, uh, Al-Jili would have studied ibn Arabi's major works, um, including his two most important works, Al-Futahat and Makiyya, uh, a voluminous study of all the major issues of Islamic theology and law from Ibn Arabi's characteristic Sufi metaphysical perspective, and the shorter Fusus al Hikam, a dense and uh, arcane treatment of Sufi met metaphysical topics using the Prophet stories of the Quran as its framework. Julia would also have studied uh, the commentaries on the Fusus 
written by uh, the, the, the disciples uh, of uh, Sadr al-Din al qunawi Ibn Arabi's designated uh, heir, Khalifa, and son-in-law, uh, Muayyad al-Din Jandi, Abdul Razak al-Qashani, and Daud Qaisari. Now, um, Al-Jili's works, of which around 20 can reliably be attributed to him, uh, including the aforementioned book on the perfect man cited by Goldsham, uh, as well as a partial commentary on Ibn Arabi's Futuhat and a long poem, um, the Anadirat al Ainiya. Uh, his works accordingly reflect the Sufi metaphysical worldview of Ibn Arabi and his followers. Now, the basis of that Sufi metaphysical worldview is what um, I like to call the idea of universal theophany. Um, this is the idea signaled by the Arabic term tajalli, literally unveiling, God's unveiling, that the phenomenal world is a manifestation of God. Its existence being merely a limited muqayyad reflection of or form of the one true and unlimited divine existence, al-wujud uh, al-mutlaq. Uh, within this overall framework, other ideas are put forward by Ibn Arabi and his disciples, such as the notion that it is the uh, names and attributes, uh, the divine names and attributes ascribed to God in the Quran, that are the connectors, or connections, nisab, between God and his creation. Uh, the idea that God uh, is both identical to and different from his creation. Um, an idea expressed uh, by this cryptic phrase, hua la hua, um, he, not he, uh, and the idea that God is both transcendent and imminent or um, incomparable and comparable to his creation. So um, the synthesis of Tanzi and Tashbir. There's also the idea that there are various planes or levels of existence um, some of which are closer to the pure existence of the divine essence than others. And as we'll see, this is an important idea um, for Gili uh, and comes into his interpretation of the scriptures. Another key idea within uh, Ibn Arabi and Sufi metaphysics, and the one that Gili is best known for and, and rightly credited for developing, is the idea of the perfect man or the, the complete human, Al-Insan al kamil now, this term, uh, Al-Insan al-Kamil, had been used uh, occasionally and um, unsystematically by Ibn Arabi. Um, and um, before him, it appears in, in various works uh, of falsafa. But after Ibn Arabi, um, it was put into a more systematic form by the commentators on the Fasus and given its classical definition uh, by Gili in the work uh, pointedly titled Al-Insan the Camel that we've already seen mentioned. Now, as already mentioned, uh, for Ibn Arabi and his followers, the entirety of existence is a manifestation of God and specifically uh, of the divine names and attributes. At the same time, however, Ibn Arabi and his followers also indicate that created beings reflect the divine names and attributes in different ways, they reflect different divine names and attributes and to different degrees. So in some uh, existence, some, some beings, for instance, God's uh, attributes of, of majesty, Jalal, such as vengeance, wrath, judgment, etc., are dominant, while in others, God's attributes of beauty, Jamal, such as mercy, compassion or love, uh, predominate. And this is how we get the, the diversity that we see within the phenomenal world. And this is Ibn Arabi and his followers' solution to the problem uh, of the one and the many, how multiplicity arises from, from unity. Now, the perfect man, however, in, um, in Gili's characterization and in, in the characterization of, of um, the other followers of Ibn Arabi, is the individual in whom all of God's attributes uh, are manifest. So it's a complete uh, reflection of all of the divine names and attributes, hence 
perfect or complete kernel. He's also uh, a microcosm of the universe, alim um, safayir in Arabic, um, an idea which again has roots in the earlier philosophical Neoplatonic tradition. And he's the pole or qutb around which the universe revolves. So um, if the perfect man were no longer to exist, Ibn Arabi and his followers say, uh, the universe would also pass away. Now, while Ibn Arabi uses the term al-insan um, most often, at least in the fasus of Adam, um, denoting Adam's status as the first and primordial um, archetypal human being, Geely insists that, properly speaking, the term uh, can only be used of Muhammad, um, whom he identifies as the one true perfect man from the beginning to the end of time. Um, so he says in chapter 60 of Al-Insan al-Kamil, which is specifically devoted to the, the idea of the perfect man, wherever the term Al-Insan al-Kamil appears in an unqualified sense, mutlaqan, in my writings, I only mean by it, uh, Muhammad. And underlying this conception is the Sufi idea of the Muhammadan reality, al-Haqiqa and muhammadiyya uh, or the Muhammadan light, also called Nur al-Muhammadi, the spiritual reality of Muhammad that was the first created thing and serves as a kind of Logos figure in the creation and preservation of the world and is also uh, the light from which the other prophets and saints draw. Now, um, as its title suggests, Al-Insan al-Kamil, um, which was Ajili's most important book, is centered around this idea of the perfect man. Indeed, Julie explicitly states that chapter 60 on the, the, the chapter devoted to the idea is the basis of the entire book. At the same time, uh, the title of the work shouldn't lead us to think that the book is just about the idea of the perfect man. Um, in fact, it's a comprehensive outline of Ibn Arabi and Sufi metaphysics, or what uh, Martin Ling's called a remarkably clear, concentrated, and profound expression of Sufi doctrine. Um, given this comprehensiveness and its relative comprehensibility, um, relative, that is, to, to Ibn Arabi's works, um, own works, it became what um, J. Spencer Trimingham called a mediating work in the Ibn Arabian Sufi tradition being widely read from West Africa to Southeast Asia as an introduction to Ibn Arabi and Sufi metaphysics. It consists of 63 chapters divided um, into two parts. The first part is, is devoted, um, generally speaking, to metaphysical and theological concepts such as the divine essence and attributes and the associated levels of existence. While the second part is mainly dedicated to uh, the exposition of Quranic concepts, such as the divine throne or the uh, preserved tablet. Um, towards the end of the first part, um, acting as a kind of bridge between the two parts, in fact, is a section made up of six chapters, this chapters 33 to 38, on the scriptures uh, that are mentioned in the Quran. Uh, the mother of the book, uh, Umm al-Kitab, that, that is the, the, the primordial heavenly archetype of the scriptures. The Quran, uh, there's a chapter on the Furqan, another name for the, for the Quran, um, um, which the Quran also uses um, for the, the scripture given to Moses. The Torah, uh, the Psalms and the Gospel. Now, although these chapters of Gili's work have received relatively uh, little attention from those scholars who have worked in a sustained way on Gili's thought, they are, I think, of significant interest for those, um, not only for, for scholars of, of Sufi metaphysics, as we'll see, but also for those interested in Muslim views of the Bible. 
given that they provide a clear window into how a major Muslim mystic interpreted the biblical scriptures um, mentioned in the Quran and universally recognized in Islam. Now, to provide, um, you know, to, to properly understand Gili's reading of the Bible, we first have to take into account um, some more general principles um, found in Sufi literature um, regarding the Sufi approach to scripture. And of course, you know, there's a, we shouldn't think of this as a kind of um, unchanging Sufi approach that there's development over time, but these, these are fairly fundamental um, principles that we also see uh, in Jili. So as is well known the, in their reading of the Quran, uh, the Sufis applied the notion that there were various levels of meaning, uh, access to which depended on a reader's spiritual station or attainment. So um, a very famous tradition that appears in Sufi works of tafsir um, is the tradition variously ascribed to Ali, Jafar al-Sadiq, um, the early Quranic commentator, uh, Ibn Abbas, or, or to the Prophet himself, according to which the Quran contains four levels of meaning, the, the zahir or apparent level, the batin, the hidden level, the normative level, the had, and the anagogical, the matla or mutalla. Um, so this is, this is kind of one framework um, which the Sufis applied to, their, to the Quran. Um, more generally, um, as you're probably aware, there's, there's a widespread distinction in Sufism as in um, Shi'i exegesis or um, the philosophical tradition between uh, generally speaking, the Zahir and the, and the Batin, the, the outward and the inward. Um, Goldzahir in his, um, in his seminal work on Quranic exegesis um, relates this to the, to the distinction um, in Alexandrian biblical exegesis between the somaticon or phenomenon and the, the pneumaticon, um, the, the outer body or form and the inner spirit. Now, like other Sufis, Gili subscribed to this notion that scripture contains various levels of meaning. A key text in this regard is a passage in his chapter on the Torah, in which he describes the levels of meaning contained in the re revelation given to Muhammad, i.e. the Quran. So there, Gili cites the following hadith uh, of the prophet. On the night that I was made to travel by night, so this is uh, a reference to the, the Isra, the, the night journey, uh, I, was, I was given three forms of knowledge, loom. Uh, a form of knowledge or ilm that I was obliged to conceal, katm, a form of knowledge that I chose to propagate, tabliq, and a form of knowledge that I was commanded to propagate. Now, Gili interprets this hadith in the following way. The form of knowledge, he says, that Muhammad was commanded to propagate was the knowledge of the religious laws, the ilm al sharia The form of knowledge that he chose to propagate was the knowledge of the realities, ilm al haqaiq Haqaiq is a, is a common term in, in Sufi metaphysical writing um, for the, the, the highest kind of, of truths. And the form of knowledge that he was obliged to conceal was that of the divine mysteries, al-asrar, al-ilahiyya. God has deposited all of that in the Quran. That, that which he command, was commanded to propagate is apparent, zahir, and that which he chose to propagate is hidden, batin. The Quranic text, he further explains, is wrapped up like a coil. The word he uses is tahayyuz. Whoever, whoever's understanding was divine, he says, had the divine realities propagated to them. And whoever's understanding was not at that level did not have them propagated to them. So in Gili's Sufi interpretation, therefore, the Quran contains different levels of meaning. 
Sufi metaphysical realities, haqqaiq, and divine mysteries, asrar, for the initiated, for the mystically advanced, and religious laws, uh, sharia, for the uninitiated. Returning to his uh, Sufi reading of the Bible then, we would similarly expect to find the notion that the Bible contains different levels of meaning. And this, I think, is what we, we do, in fact, find. Specifically, in his discussion of the Torah, Psalms, and Gospel, um, we find that Chile presents us with, with two different levels um, of information, levels of meaning, levels on which the biblical scriptures can be understood. And these um, I've referred to as the historical and the Sufi metaphysical. Now to understand what I mean by this, let's look uh, more closely at his chapters on the scriptures in al insan al kamil Now to begin with the historical um, level of interpretation, these chapters provide us with considerable information on the history of the scriptures, that is to whom, why, and how they were revealed, the languages in which they were revealed, the ways in which they have been interpreted by those who hold them sacred, and their place in sacred history, that is their, the story of God's interaction with his creation through his messengers. And this is the kind of information that, that we saw um, discussed in, in Munim's excellent paper. So much of this uh, historical information is the, of the kind that uh, we find in the Tafsir tradition, the, the Quranic uh, exegetical tradition, and a lot of it is what uh, is of the kind that the Islamic tradition terms Israeliat, that is stories borrowed from Jewish tradition, mainly brought into Islam by early Jewish converts that supplement the prophetic stories of the Quran with biblical and extra biblical information. At times then, Geely's discussion of the biblical scriptures resembles the tales of the prophets, Qisas al literature, uh, written by al kisai Atha'alibi and, and others. Now, for instance, to, to give some, some examples of this, um, in his chapter on the Torah, Gili discusses the revelation of the, the Torah to Moses, um, which uh, he says in, in accordance with uh, Quran 7156, that the Torah was revealed in, in tablets, al -Wah. Um Now, um, Judy tells us that God revealed nine tablets to Moses, but commanded him to propagate only seven of those to his people, um, because two of them contained exalted divine mysteries that Moses' people could not comprehend. And there we, we see the same ideas about um, divine mysteries which shouldn't be propagated to the uninitiated as we, as we saw in that. Um, other other passage that I just quoted. Now the seven tablets that, that Moses was commanded to reveal, he, he further tells us, were made of marble um, and this was a symbol of the hardness of the children of Israel's hearts, uh, another Quranic uh, motif, while the two tablets that he was commanded to hide were made of God's light, Nur. Julie identifies the seven propagated tablets as the tablets of light, guidance, that's Nur Wahuda, which um, the Quran um, uses of the Torah, wisdom, hikmah, the faculties, uh, judgment, servanthood, and what he calls the clarification of the path of felicity from that of misery. While the two hidden tablets uh, he identifies as those of divine lordship, Rububiya and power, Qudra. Geely discusses at some length the contents of the seven propagated tablets, identifying, for instance, the tablet of judgment, Hukm, as the tablet which contains the mosaic legislation, a Tashriya and Musawi, on which the Jews built, he says. Or uh, he identifies the tablet of the faculties as that which contains information on letter mysticism and magic. Other tablets, he tells us, contain uh, what can only be described as mystical guidance. The tablet of, of Huda of guidance, he explains, contains 
quo sciences acquired by taste, olum dhulqiya. And the, the term dhulq is a, is a key term in, in the Sufi lexicon for, for mystical experience. There's that tablet, he also says, sets out the path to the most advanced spiritual station and the most radiant level where there is nowhere. So that's a, you know, the idea of um, a place where, of, where there is no place is another characteristically Sufi formulation. So here we see that Gili's Sufi perspective also penetrates the historical level of interpretation as well as the metaphysical level. Other uh, historical information uh, contained in Gili's reading of the, of the biblical scriptures includes the language of the scriptures, uh, the languages in which they were revealed, and the qualities of the messengers or prophets to whom they were sent. So Gili explains, for instance, that Azabur, the, the Quranic word for the book of Psalms, is, quote, a Syriac word that means uh, the book, Al-Kitab. And then he says that the Arabs used it. So this, uh, again, um, reminds us of what we heard in Munim's paper, um, the idea of, of foreign words being uh, Arabicized. Elsewhere in the, ch in the chapter on the gospel, we're told that God sent down the gospel to Jesus in the Syriac language, and it was read or, or recited in 17 languages. He doesn't tell us which, what these languages were, and um, we can only speculate what he, what, what he has in mind. As for the prophets, uh, the reader of Gili's book is informed that David, the recipient of Azabur, the Psalms, was, quote, the loveliest of people in conversation and the best of them in character traits. When he recited the Psalms, the animals, specifically the wild animals and the birds, would stand around him. He was slender of body and short of stature, but possessed great strength and was well acquainted with the sciences in use in his time. Explaining the Quranic statement that David and uh, his son Solomon were taught the language of the birds, Quran 2716, Gili further explains that David used to speak to the animals in Syriac or in any other of the animal sounds if he wished. And again, we have to speculate. Which one paper was, was it made? But sorry, there's a bit of interference on the line. I don't know. Oh, if... sorry. Maybe my my script, I think, might be going on the microphone. Uh, Is that okay. better? So we can only speculate why Julia is so interested in this issue of the of the languages. As we saw from Munim's paper, it's it's an interest that the Quran exegetes are also um, we also find in in, in the works of the, the Quranic exegetes. Um, it might also be connected to the idea advanced by Ibn Arabi uh, in one of his uh, shorter treatises that um, a mystic who enjoys a special spiritual relationship with a particular prophet, speaks the language of that prophet, um, or more specifically, the language in which the prophet received his revelation. So again, there may be a Sufi component to this um, historical level of, of interpretation. Also of a historical nature are Gili's discussions of the beliefs and practices that the Jews and Christians derive from their scriptures. Um, the Mosaic legislation has already been mentioned. Um, uh, in his presentation of the gospel, meanwhile, Gili informs the reader that the gospel begins with the formula in the name of the father, the mother, and the son, Bismil Ab wal Um al Ibn. Um, and that because they took this, the Christians, that is, took this in its apparent or Zahir meaning they erroneously believed in a triune God, um, specifically a God of the Holy Spirit, Mary and Jesus. And this, this kind of um, rather, uh, what might appear to us a rather strange Trinity seems to be an extrapolation of the Quranic view that the Christians take Jesus and Mary 
as two gods besides God, Quran 5, 116. Elsewhere, we're, we're likewise told that as a result of Christological disputes, uh, the Christians split into sects, uh, with the Melkites saying that Jesus is the son of God, Ibn Allah, the Jacobites that Jesus is God, who came down and took the form of Adam before returning to his, his exalted nature, and that an unnamed Christian group um, held that God is a father, quote, who is the Holy Spirit, a mother who is Mary and a son who is Jesus, end quote. So Gili extrapolates various Christian um, doctrines out of what he believes to be the content of the gospel. So um, at the level of, of sacred history, um, sorry, let me go back. At the level of sacred history, meanwhile, um, we encounter reflections on God's providential reasoning in revealing certain truths through certain scriptures at certain times. Thus, having been told that Moses was commanded by God to conceal the tablets containing the two mysteries of divine lordship and power, we are told that if Moses had been commanded to propagate the two tablets that were unique to him, God would not have sent Jesus after him because Jesus propagated the mystery of those two tablets to his people. So Jesus reveals mysteries hidden by Moses, hence the, the need for the revelation of the gospel. So as I've already indicated, most of this historical information is to a large extent of a, what we might call a, a Haggadic character of the kind found in tales of the prophets, literature, works of universal his history or Quranic exegesis. It doesn't suggest uh, an engagement on Julie's part with the canonical biblical scriptures. Indeed, um, I think we can be fairly sure based on uh, Julie's presentation of the contents of the Torah, Psalms and gospel, uh, that he hadn't read um, anything resembling the canonical Old and New Testaments. Rather, like many medieval Muslim authors, his Torah, Psalms and Gospel um, are what uh, David Vishenoff has, has called imagined scriptures. That is books whose contents have been creatively reimagined uh, based on information available from Islamic historical exe and exegetical sources. So al Jili's presentation of the attributes of David, for instance, that he was lovely in conversation, spoke to the birds, great in strength, very learned, bears a close resemblance to the portrayal of David in Atabari's uh, monumental history or in Atha'a uh, work of Tales of the Prophets, Arais al Majalis. While his presentation of the Christological differences of the different Christian sects is similar in form and content to what we find in doxographical works um, like uh, Ashah Rizani or Ibn Hazm. And while, as we've seen uh, in the case of the contents of the Torah, Jili's Sufi per perspective does sometimes come into this historical level of interpretation, nevertheless, much of this historical information doesn't have a discernible Sufi content. Nevertheless, Jili's Sufi reading of the biblical scriptures is clearly a Sufi one. What makes it so is, is what I've called the Sufi metaphysical level of interpretation. For Jili, the scriptures mentioned in the Quran are not simply sacred books revealed by God to a messenger at a certain point in history. They're also expressions, the word he uses is ibarat, of divine attributes and metaphysical realities. To understand what Jili means by this, um, we have to look again at his Sufi metaphysics. As I briefly mentioned earlier, one of the key components of the Ibn Arabian idea of universal theophany is the notion of the levels or planes of existence, according to which some things are closer to the pure existence of the divine essence than others. In this context, Ibn Arabi's commentators typically set out a scheme of five, six, or seven hadarat or presences, beginning with the divine essence, 
they're moving down through the divine names and attributes, then to the realm of the angels and spirits, and finally to the phenomenal realm. Julie, for his part, sets out a scheme of 40 levels of existence, um, although the, the kind of overall scheme is, is very similar, beginning with the divine essence in its most unqualified, indescribable and hidden state, and culminating with the perfect man, who as the microcosm of the universe and locus of manifestation of all the divine names and attributes, reconciles all of the 40 levels within himself. Within this scheme, the highest uh, levels of existence are named according to the divine names and attributes. Thus, according to the scheme set out in Gili's final work, Muratibul Wajud, after the unknowable divine essence comes first the level of Ahadiyya or unqualified unity, or also known as Al Wajud al Mutlaq, unqualified existence. This is the first turn of the unqualified essence towards phenomenality. Then comes the level of Al Wahidiyya, qualified unity. Then the level of Uluhiya, divinity, at which all of the divine names and attributes emerge in a manifest way. Then the level of Rahmaniya, or all mercifulness. Then the level of Rububiya, or divine lordship. Then the level of Malikiya, or divine kingship, and so on and so forth. Now, the relevance of all this for Gili's reading of the Bible is that at the Sufi metaphysical level, at the level of uh, illusion, uh, allusion, sorry, Ishara. He tells us each of the scriptures is an expression of one of these levels and the divine names and attributes associated with those levels. Thus, the Quran corresponds to what Juli calls the level of Ahadiyya, the unqualified unity of the divine essence, the, which is the second level of existence. The gospel corresponds to the level of Wahidiyya or qualified unity. Uh, i.e. the third level of existence, the Torah to the level of Rahmaniya or mercifulness, the fifth level, and the Psalms to the level of Malikiya or kingship, the seventh level. What this means, I think, for Gili is that all of the scriptures reveal God in a different way. That is, God um, as he appears at each of these different high, uh, levels of existence. And elsewhere in the chapter on the Psalms, Gili explains this in terms of the different kinds of divine names and attributes. And here we have the quote uh, from the chapter of the Psalms. Know that the Psalms, as the Boer, in the language of illusion, is an expression of the manifestations of the attributes of the divine acts, uh, while the Torah is an expression of the manifestations of all of the names of the attributes, and the Gospel is an expression of the manifestations of the names of the essence, and the Furqan is an expression of the manifestations of all of the attributes and names in an unrestricted way, that is, both the names and attributes of the essence and those of the attributes, while the Quran is an expression of the pure essence of that and Mahat. This is all um, a bit complicated, but um, these various terms they come up in, in Islamic theological discussions, uh, distinctions between the different kinds of divine names and attributes. Um, what emerges from all this, um, if we kind of move beyond the, the, the precise signification of those terms is a hierarchy of scriptures. So with the Quran at the summit, uh, then the gospel, then the Torah, then the Psalms, according to which they reveal the different divine names and attributes. al Juli seems to be saying that it is only in the Quran that God is revealed in his fullness, in his, in his essence, as well as all of his names and attributes. As for the biblical scriptures, while one can come to know the divine names and attributes through them, they do not reveal all of those names and attributes or God in his essence. And this, I, I would say, is, is Juli's um, Sufi metaphysical take on the doctrine of, of Nasr, of, of the um, abrogation of the earlier scriptures by the Quran. I realize I'm almost out of time, so um, I better wrap this up, but just, I wanted to talk about his, uh, Gili's um, interpretation of the uh, contents of the of the gospel and of the of the trinity in particular and just to briefly sum up he thinks the christians are right 
to talk about the Trinity, but that they misinterpret it. The Trinity represents for him three of the highest levels of divine existence, the, the divine essence itself, God's divinity and, and his unqualified existence. The Christians, as we've already seen, um, make the mistake of, of misinterpreting it because they take it in what Judy deems to be its literal sense. Because of this, they fall into the errors of, of Tashbi, of likening God to his creation through their belief in the, in the incarnation, and Tajseem, of believing in, in an embodied God. And the error of Hus, of limiting the unlimitable divine existence to a singular, singular manifestation in the, perf, in the person of Jesus. Julie tells us that had they accepted the Quran, they would have understood the truth of the matter because the Quran reveals the, the Sufi metaphysical truths that, that Julie adheres to. So just to sum up, we've seen that Julie's interest in the Bible on two levels, which I've termed the historical and the, and the Sufi metaphysical. His uh, historical information on the biblical scriptures is based not on a direct engagement with the canonical Bible, but on information available to him from Islamic sources. Um, this information, um, often having no discernible mystical component, is interwoven with reflections on the Sufi metaphysical truths uh, revealed by the various scriptures. At this level of interpretation, Geely reads his Ibn Arabi and Sufi metaphysics into the Bible, associating each of the scriptures with a particular level of divine existence and uncovering Sufi metaphysical truths, such as the fundamental idea of universal theophany in biblical statements like the Trinitarian formula. I think I'll stop there and then maybe we can um, discuss this further in the, in the